So thank you very much, and welcome again to uh, the lecture. We will continue talking about success and emotional intelligence. So today, I will talk about the intelligence, emotional intelligence framework again. This is something that I'll keep on repeating. And I will specifically talk about self-awareness again, something that we have talked about many times, and I, I believe it's very useful to keep on addressing that. Then we will, talk about, we will share some success stories from both the online community and also the, uh, the on-campus community. So I just took the liberty to use that. It's available online, so I think all of you have access to it, but I really thought it's, it's high time that we, we look into that in details. Uh, there were some questions about meditation. So I'm going to talk about meditation and I'm going to uh, get you to meditate again. Yeah, yeah, something that quite a number of people indicated that they enjoyed. Good. I will be talking about emotions and facial muscles. This is uh, uh, something of uh, interest to me personally. And I believe uh, what I'm going to share with you is going to be maybe new to quite a number of you. And it's extremely interesting. And uh, I'll end up by talking about the brain, how it's structured, the three brains, and how is that related to communication. So again, you will see this slide almost every time we talk. I really would like you to remember that the emotional intelligence framework that was developed by uh, Daniel Goleman is based on the self-awareness, the social awareness, the self-management, and the relationship management. So again, the, this horizontal line, these two quadrants are about awareness, and these are about regulation. While this column here is related to things related to self, so they are about me, about you, and here is about the social all or the relational uh, realm. So, <clears throat> and, and we are still pretty much in, in this. This is a cornerstone of the uh, the uh, model and it, everything starts there. So from the self-awareness comes the self-management. If we are not aware of our emotion, there's no way we can manage them. So that's really the message that I have been repeating and repeating again and again. And when we are aware of our own emotions, it's going to be easier for us to be aware of other people's emotions and also our impact on their emotions. So hence the social awareness. And ultimately, when we have those sort of conquered, we could do the relationship management. How do we become successful people in teams? How do we have good impact on, on life? And this is not just fluffy things that I'm telling you. This is about your success, about you becoming leaders in the global community, you becoming uh, uh, effective team players, whether in your group as we speak today, or in your study group, or eventually as you progress in your studies and, and, and move on to the workforce. So this is something that I will keep on repeating because I think we should not lose sight of. Now, in self-awareness, we do my emotions today. And my emotions today are planned or, 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 or developed, structured, constructed to give every one of us first the awareness of our emotions and secondly and equally importantly the language to describe them. And that's why you've noticed when uh, for those of you who do my emotions today regularly or semi-regularly. If you just choose a word like OK, I will say, please, can you, can you describe your emotions more accurately? So who was saying, I am mentally messed up, emotionally messed up, 
relationally messed up. I, I, I know the face because from the picture is, who, who was doing that? Is that, that was, was, that was you? No, I thought it was you, right? No, so that's you. So everything is messed up, messed up, messed up, messed up. So I said, what do you mean? Choose, choose another word. So I say, okay, since you insist, I'm mentally screwed. <laughs> yeah, so, so these are still, still, you know, this is just an attempt. You are feeling that there's something wrong, but you are somehow unable to describe it. Now, until you can say in a word, what is happening to you mentally, emotionally, relationally, you won't be able to, uh, to actually uh, uh, move confidently into the realm of self-management. Now, um, normally I don't get this part recorded, but I really want to say this on camera. I believe, and I think, and I feel that the on-campus students are not making good use of the tools provided to them. I, I'm there on a daily basis, and I can tell, unfortunately, majority of you don't do brain wiring, brain rewiring and my emotions today on a daily basis. And hence, this is going to be a requirement for you to pass the course. So I want you to take this seriously because emotional awareness, there's no way to achieve it by just reading about it. There's no way to achieve it by just learning the definition. This is a, a very big thing, and I have sort of to push you guys to do the exercise daily. Now, the beautiful thing about this exercise is just like the physical exercise. If you do it, even if you don't like it in the beginning, your muscles will get stronger, whether you like it or not. So I'm going to force you to be emotionally aware whether you like it or not. So I really would like you, please, to start from today to regularly exercise your emotional awareness through my emotions today and brain rewiring. And this is going to be, I'm going to start taking note of what's happening. And if you miss and, and you are unable to say, at the week that I have rewired my brain daily and I have reported my emotions daily, then that will affect your progression. So do you have any question or comment on this part? Because this is something that I'm telling you. And that includes the people who have just joined us. Yeah, the latecomers. So when was the last time you did your uh, brain rewiring and have you d I'm talking to him have you done your brain rewiring not yet okay so if you have any plans on passing this module you need to start taking this more seriously okay so this is this is how we are hoped we 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 hope that we can achieve the emotional awareness. So this is an extremely important exercise that I would like you to take seriously and, and do it daily. It won't take much of your time. It won't. It won't. Hans, any question or comment? Well, it's been like two weeks. I'm on open learning. And it's a really interactive because I've been doing all the quiz, all the brain rewiring and emotions so it's good to use open learning as from now even my parents in Mauritius are in open learning they started liking it and get used to how to work with it thank you that's that's great but 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 before before you upload before you upload I don't think you are doing it daily I did it not like the last few days but I was busy with assignment but right so, as soon as I'm free, okay. I'm doing it. So please, reporting your emotions. Thank you very much for, for that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Great.
But I, I really would like you to take my emotions today and brain rewiring very seriously. Now, if you want to take it seriously, because I've shown you both the biological evidence by bringing the brain here, by sharing with you the neurological research, or by doing it merely to pass this course, the choice is yours. But you have to do it. You have to do it. So that's, that's the first thing. Now, in terms of self-motivation, we, we are doing this through brain rewiring. So brain rewiring will create that positive connections in the brain that will make us look into everything that's happening from a positive angle. And we will be seeing things that happening to us as opportunities rather than peas and challenges. And that's an extremely important um, uh, antidote for negativity. Now these are things that people do pay or willing to pay a lot of money to achieve. You know, they want to be positive, they want to be self-motivated, they want to be self-aware. And interestingly enough, there is no app that you download and you be self-motivated. This is just like the physical exercise. You have to do it. You want to improve your health, you, have, you want to improve your stamina, you have to go and you know, alter your diet, start doing some physical exercise. So these are things that you cannot buy. These are things that you have to do on your own. So these are the, what I'm, what I'm uh, planning to speak uh, about. Now, self-confidence and, and, and accurate self-assessment are things that I'm going to speak about the next lecture. And I'm going to give you some exercises related to that. So the, because I, as I mentioned to you, the self-awareness is a cornerstone of the emotional intelligence, the, uh, the uh, brain rewiring and my emotions today is something that we will be doing daily until we finish the course. I really hope that you guys find this very useful, that you'll continue the exercise even after you graduate from my course. And um, I hope that we'll be able to measure very uh, specific uh, results in each and every one of us, including me. Because while doing the exercises in, with you, I am changing as well. And I would like to be, this to be part of my uh, self-development. So I thought of sharing with you some of the, of the success stories. Again, I'm referring to uh, Phoenix Slum. Yeah, so hi, Phoenix. Yeah, he's so active, yes. We're, okay, who, who knows who, who is Phoenix? Okay, raise your hands. Would you like to give him a big, huge round of applause? So what did he do? He, he thought it would be great if those people who have a success story that happened because of the exercises that they're doing through the course or because of uh, their enrollment or happened to them while they are with us, they wanted them to share it. So he created it first on the peer content. And because of it's, it's, it's so pertinent and so useful, I have elevated it to the main navigation bar. So now, next to uh, uh, brain rewiring and my emotions today, you have the Awesomeness Club. Now, the Awesomeness Club is something that, if something great happened, please report it there. We would like to hear about it. Now, I have picked uh, this from um, Andrea, and I'm going to read it. Because I think this is, this is really, really interesting. So she said, Victory, victory, victory. You may remember that I shared with you how my daughter is on a mission to divide and conquer every day and that she often annoys me so much that I just wanna dot, dot, dot. I let you fill the blanks. However, yesterday was a great day. Even though I came home tired and with a bit of a headache, 
and just wanted to sit down and stare into thin air, I took a deep breath in and told myself that I was going to smile no matter what and try meet her, the daughter, on her premises. And thank you, Phoenix Slam, again, for reminding me that she is not annoying me on purpose. She is just being authentic and true to her emotions. Oh, the change. Everything went smooth, even when she still didn't want to do what I had as, as or something like that. I didn't get angry. I was in touch myself with myself and my emotions. And whether, whenever I felt anger on its way, so that's the awareness part, anger is coming, she's catching it even before it, it, it happens, I just took a deep breath in. One of many. Stayed patient and moved on. No tears, no anger, lots of smiles and love. It turned everything around even got her to eat cauliflower. And that is a record. Because anything from the green side, it's, an, it's her enemy. And today, I did it again. Told her that I didn't want to get mad or upset with her. I wanted us to be good friends. And therefore, I need her help and would like her to do what I say. She looked at me, smiled, and said, okay, mom, done. Now, I think what, what Andrea did, she really moved to the self-management part, into the relationship management, and these are things that we are going to put more emphasis on. So this is something that she has shared. And I really would like you guys to share if there is um, um, something of, of, of that nature. Now. The reason why I'm telling you this is, is to really to sell to you, please do brain rewiring. Please do my emotions today. Do it religiously. Do it daily. Don't, if you, you set some rituals around it. So you could do it when you wake up. You could do it before you sleep. You, you just set some time and, and, and report those. And believe me, good things are going to happen. Now the next sharing is from one of our people here. Now, interestingly, she shared this even before we have the Awesomeness Club. So I, I really have to uh, give her credit for, for, for this. Yet, Phoenix Slum is still featured, featured there. So she said, Phoenix, you are the most enthusiastic person that I have come across. Maybe, maybe the second most, right? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Um, I would like to share a little of my experience and things that I have learned from this wonderful co course. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to me. So that, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I am very grateful to study this course with uh, Mushtaq at Taylor's University. I am very proud of it and glad that most of my classmates have joined this beneficial course. Uh, at first, brain rewiring and my emotions today was a challenge. It was really awkward to think and be aware of things that I am grateful for. And my daily emotions. Brain rewiring has helped to realize how fortunate I am to have things that some don't. Instead of complaining about what I don't have or finding faults on what I have, I have begun to be thankful for everything and see things positively. Brain rewiring has taught me see life in a very different way. My emotions today did wonders. My parents often say that I am short-tempered and I should control my emotions. I tried, but nothing worked except for this course. I really meant it when I said did wonders. After, my, after doing my emotions today, I have learned to express my feelings and control them. Mushtaq, you were absolutely right. Taking a deep breath before deciding or reacting is, is vital. So the rest of it, I think she described the course and say how, how much fun she is having with the online students. Now, having a community is extremely important because at times we may think that it's only us who are 
you know, angry or who are unable to control their emotions. But when we know how difficult it is really to be aware of the emotions in the first place and eventually uh, get to the point of managing oneself and our impact on, on the others, that will make us feel like I'm not alone. And if X or Y or Z can do it, maybe I also can do it. And I would share one day something on the, on the Awesomeness uh, Club uh, webpage. So I, I, again, there's a reason why I've shared this. There's a reason why I picked someone even outside the country who have just opted to do this and join us and, and, and share her, her wonderful uh, findings and also someone who is amongst uh, the, rest, the rest of us. Any question or comments about what we've shared thus far? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on. The next thing that I'm going to talk about because people have asked about was meditation. And um, you guys have done the first meditation session, right? Yes. Okay. Have you noticed that you get your attention you focus on your breathing and something happened. You start to think of something else. Was this, was this an, an experience of, of, of most of us? Yeah. Who, who has experienced this? Raise your hand. Okay. Who didn't hear me? Raise your hand. Please pay attention. Please pay attention. So I said in the previous meditation session, we need to focus on our breathing. It starts wonderful, great, I'm just focusing on the air, and suddenly I start to, my, my mind start, start to wander, start to think of other things. Was this a common experience? If it is, raise your hand. Okay. Now this is, this is actually quite expected and very normal. And meditation doesn't create this state. Meditation helps us be aware. So inside each one of us, there is a sea of emotions. Even when we think we are not thinking of anything, there is this sea of, of emotions. And it sometimes it's turbulent and wavy. Sometimes at the, at the surface, it may not be that turbulent, but within it is quite turbulent. So what meditation help us to achieve is to be aware of all that. And we've said all emotions are okay. We don't have to judge our emotions. We have to accept our emotions. It's only the behavior that results from the emotion could be acceptable or not. So that is a key thing. Meditation makes us aware of the emotions. Hence, it is a powerful tool of self-awareness. Meditation actually can also help us in be motivating ourselves and even managing ourselves both emotionally and, and physically. So today what I'm going to do, I'm going to get you through another meditation session. So uh, it's going to be different from the first one, so we, I, I want to introduce you to a variety of meditation techniques. And later you could uh, get any, there are plenty of, uh, of uh, audios or, or, or soundtracks that you could use them. But the whole idea is, eventually you will be able to do that on your own, without even the need for a soundtrack. Anything to share with us? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. So during during the lecture, I would uh, appreciate if I don't ask you to you know to refer to open learning. I really hope that you do the brain wiring outside the class. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm going to give you now the. Uh, so I want you to, as as I said the other day, I want you to get very comfortable, please. Okay, so this is, this is actually called, is, is, this is a different kind of meditation. It's not like the one, the breathing that we've done uh, two weeks earlier. This is, uh, this is called the body scan. So you will get to go around your body in your own mind and be aware of all the sensations that are happening there. 
So I'm going to start. Yeah. Please be with us and um, just follow the instruction and trust the process. Now let's move on to the body scan. This meditation has its roots in the ancient art of Hatha Yoga. While most of the yoga poses involve stretches, one of the most basic poses is called Yoga Nidra, in which the yogi does not move at all, but merely moves his mind through his body, mentally letting each area relax throughout the body. This technique is a powerful way to become deeply relaxed, soothing the muscles throughout your body. In the modern world, this technique is used by physicians and psychologists to guide people into a healing state of deep relaxation. In that state, your worries don't trouble you so much. You feel calm and at peace, and your body is in the same relaxed state that yields the health benefits common to all meditation techniques. You can do the body scan sitting up, as you did for the breath meditation, or lying down on your back. If you lie down, choose a firm, pliable surface like a carpet, and be sure that you'll be warm enough. Get comfortable now and close your eyes. Let's begin. Start by bringing your awareness to your forehead using your mind like a gentle radar sweep from side to side across your forehead noticing very carefully whatever sensations there are if it's warm or cool tingling tight or relaxed or nothing in particular whatever you feel just be with the sensations letting them register in your awareness Pay particular attention to the muscle that makes a frown just above your nose. If you feel any tension there, let the muscle soften and relax. Now shift your awareness to your left eye. Scan the eyebrow, the area above the eye, the eyelid. Now the muscles all around the eye. Just notice whatever sensations you find there. Let any tension ease away. Let the muscles soften. Now move on to your right eye. Be aware of any sensations there. Wherever you find tension, let it ease away. Now scan your nose from the point between the eyes down to the tip and nostrils. Be with whatever sensations you find. And then shift over to your left cheek, softly sweeping from side to side, from below the eye down to the jaw. Noticing the sensations, letting any tension relax, soften. Now to the right cheek, scanning from side to side, from the eye down to the jaw, 
just noting sensations, letting tense muscles soften, relax. Now around your mouth. Letting your lips part a bit. Relaxing any tension. And along your chin. Letting your jaw drop a bit as the muscles around it soften and relax. And now up to your left ear, carefully noticing whatever you feel there. And over to the right ear, just noticing the sensations. scalp, scanning from above the forehead down to the back of your neck, going from side to side, noticing whatever sensations you find. And then all around the neck, scanning from the throat around each side, to the spine at the back, paying special attention to the muscles at the back of your neck, letting any tension there relax, letting the muscles go easy, soften. Out the right shoulder, along the top and the sides, being aware of any sensations there. Scanning on down from the shoulder to the elbow. the elbow to the wrist, being aware of whatever sensations you find, letting go of any tension. And now on through your right hand, wherever you find tension, let it ease and relax. Let the muscles soften. Now up to your left shoulder, scanning out along the top and sides, noticing any sensations. And on down from the shoulder to the elbow. The elbow to the wrist. Being with any sensations you find letting go of any tension.
and on through your left hand, letting go of tension wherever you find it, letting the hand be easy, relaxed. Now move up to the top of your back, just beneath the neck. Pay very close attention to the sensations as you scan down your spine and from side to side. Letting the muscles around your shoulder blades go easy. Letting your shoulders drop a bit as your upper back and neck relax. Letting the muscles ease and go soft. Relax. On down to your lower back. Noting any tension. Letting the muscles soften, be easy. And now up to your chest, scanning from side to side, from your neck down to your belly. And now exhale completely and take a deep breath into your belly, feeling your belly rise and stretch as it expands. And exhale fully, letting your belly relax. Let your breathing go back to normal. Now move down into your groin and pelvis, noticing the sensations there, letting go of any tension. And on through the right side of your bottom and the entire thigh, being with whatever you feel, Letting the muscles ease and relax. Down into your right knee, noting the feelings in the joint. Letting the muscles around the knee go soft and relax. down your calf and shin to your right ankle. Being with the sensations, letting the muscles go easy. Now through your right foot with its many bones, letting go of any tension, letting the muscles go soft, relaxed. And now up to the left side of your bottom and through your left thigh.
noticing whatever sensations are there, just letting the feelings be, letting the muscles go soft and easy. And down into your left knee, noting the feelings in the joint. Letting the muscles around the knee soften. On down your left calf and shin to the ankle. Noticing the feelings, letting the muscles soften and relax. And through your left foot, Letting the many muscles soften, relax. And now with your mind, scan freely through your entire body, being aware of this sense of ease and freedom, the easy feeling of peace, Stillness. Wherever you find any tension in your body, let the muscles soften and go easy. Spend a few more moments in this calm, peaceful and still. And when you feel ready to stop, Open your eyes and carry this relaxed alertness with you through the rest of your day. What do you think? What do you feel? Anyone would like to share anything? Anyone would like to share anything, please? How, how did you feel? How was your feeling? Feel very relaxed. You feel very relaxed. And actually relaxation is a very important thing for health. It's, it's very well known now, if you are relaxed, you will live longer, you will have a happier, healthier life. Any, any, other, any other thing to be shared? Um, something that you felt that you would like to share with us? So when, 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 when the, wh which one you prefer, this one or the, the breathing? breathing? The breathing, you, you, you prefer that, okay, okay. So did, did you notice the, you, you know in our emotions today, there is, I am physically so and so. Did, did you notice like when, say okay, pay attention to your knee. And you really realize that there is a universe there. There are muscles, there are, and suddenly you feel Yes, I can feel my knee. Now this is an extremely important thing because we said everything starts here, starts in the brain, and, and you could impact the effectiveness, the health of, of different parts of your body through the way uh, you think. 
So the next part, I'm going to talk about the relationship between emotions and muscles. So maybe this is also to link us back to, to the meditation session that we, we just, uh, just been uh, through. And specifically, the facial mu muscles. Paul Ekman is the world leading authority on the emotions and facial expressions. So he actually can look at you and know whether you are telling a lie, telling the truth, and he has been working with law enforcement. He has been working for a few decades on, on, uh, on this. And interestingly, he, fo he found out that there are 43 facial muscles that is related to emotions. And this is irrelevant or not, um, is not uh, affected by your racial group, gender, country, whatever. Regardless, as long as you are a human being, there are some 43 muscles in your face that are closely related to emotions. And I want to talk about that. And these, interestingly, these muscles are continuously working, reflecting and affecting by our emotions, even if we are you know, not aware of it. And he also identified these basic emotions. So the basic emotions are anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness, and surprise. And every one of these basic emotions, we could express a cocktail of emotions. You could be both fearful and surprised, uh, happy and surprised, uh, uh, sad and disgusted and angry at the same time. But there is that connection between certain muscles that are working and the emotions that is being uh, experienced by, by the individual. So, so this is how, uh, how the, these emotions are, uh, are, are, are expressed. And um, as you can see, the level of emotion starts from low to the highest. And here you have the surprise, the sad face, the happy, fear, disgust, and, and, and anger. Yeah. So where do you feel today? So this is low happiness, and high happiness increases as we move on. Now, interestingly, this paper, uh, this, this image, I got it from an engineering computer science paper, because now there is a lot of work on um, uh, image recognition, so there is a device could take a picture of you and straight away tell your emotions or tell whether you are being genuine or not. What are you thinking of? Are you with us or are you somewhere else? So these things are, are, uh, uh, are possible nowadays. Now I would like to really focus on the smile. And the smile is you have a beautiful smile, isn't she? No, you don't. Okay. So, so how can you tell if the person is genuinely smiling or just pretending to smile? The eyes. The eyes. What, what happened to the eyes? So the eyes are squeezed. So, so if you look at this smile compared to this smile compared to this smile if I just <laughs> and but if I am really happy to see you there are other muscles so that the real happiness the real joy you cannot just simply draw it on your face you could just draw a smile but 
it's very difficult to have the real uh, smile. And the real smile will happen when these muscles, you know, they also get engaged. So um, if I fake smile, most likely only my lips will be involved. But if it is a genuine smile, then the cheeks will go up and the eyes will, you know, yeah. So, so, so you see, if you are trying to fake it, it's like it sounds But okay, uh, there, there is there is a reason why I I brought this up, and it's related to the realm of uh, emotional awareness. So, while Ekman was uh, studying the facial muscles identifying the 43 muscles. He actually did experiments on himself and his uh, fellow researchers. So the way they, they, they did it, they could actually go uh, using some electrical uh, electrode and activate the muscles that make you feel, uh, uh, that reflects supposedly happiness, sadness, disgust, and things like that. And and uh, they have worked, as I told you, with, uh, with law enforcement. And also, they work in the, learn, in the realm of, uh, of relationship management. So they work with couples. And they get them to discuss something. And they just focus the camera on their facial expressions. And there are micro expressions with which they could tell whether these people will be married after a year or not. Yes. That, that's all reported in, 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 in a book by Paul Ekman that's called Emotions Revealed. So I, I encourage you to read it. It's amazing how much you can tell about how a person feels from the, his or her uh, face. Now, the interesting thing that I wanted to talk about here is this. We believe, or at least we think, that the face is where our emotions are projected. So if we feel really happy, then we will give you this genuine kind of real smile. If we feel disgust, there's, you know, some, you, 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 you will, you will, your mouth will move in a certain way, and that will engage a number of, 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 of muscles. If you are angry, the eyes and the face, will, and, and especially if you notice during the, during the, um, the meditation, uh, the narrator asks you to pay specific attention to the muscle here, because this is really related to you know, tension and anger and, and emotions that, of, of that nature. So I go back to what I was saying. The common belief is, I have emotions, and my emotions are expressed on my face. So the happiness starts within, then the face expressed it. It's a mirror that shows what is inside. However, during that experiment that these uh, people did with Paul Ekman, where they started to activate the sad muscles, at the end of the day, they were really feeling down. They were feeling depressed. And now, coming from this research, we know that it's not only the emotions are reflected on the face, but also if we change the face to be sad, we will internally be sad. So that's why it's actually good to try to smile as much as you can. So if you train yourself to smile and be aware that it has to be the smile that affects the eyes as well, so it's the genuine smile, then the likelihood that you'll motivate yourself to be more um, 
happy and positive is going to be very high. So I would like to, to I would like you to pay attention to this. Interestingly, I have some sharing from the Awesomeness Club. And uh, Marco says, for the last couple of days, I've been trying a new approach to life. I realize that seeing people smiling and in good mood can set me to positive mood as well. I was on a bus and there was this small child saying hello and smiling to everybody. I noticed how everyone started smiling after the child had greeted them, even if they seemed to be in bad mood before. So I decided to try and smile and spread the joy to the people around me. My message is we can shape the world to be better with little things and we definitely should do it. So smile to people and try to make their day better. So this is, this is, this is a very interesting thing because um, the uh, neuroscientist managed to identify a neuron that is called the, they, they called it the mirror neuron. And, and this neuron, it, it, it's available only in humans. And when we see someone, we tend to somehow reflect their emotions. So you are not smiling now, but you started to smile, and this is a very genuine smile. I could see the eyes are engaged, the, and that will, will somehow impact me. Now, I, I want you to keep that in mind while hopefully the FIE students will, will go around and uh, smile, <laughs> smile more, yeah. And, and remember, through that you are motivating yourself and motivating uh, someone else. So this is the part that I, I thought is going to be very, um, very interesting. And you could do a bit more search. So if you go to Paul Ekman's website, you'll find other materials, videos, pictures that are talking about uh, interviews with him on how he, uh, uh, his work on identifying the muscles and, and different facial expressions and how they are related to, um, to our emotions. But the key thing is, it's not necessarily emotions than facial expression, but we could start the emotion by starting a facial expression. So that's, I believe, is, a, is, is something that is uh, of, a, of a lot of interest. Now, um, the last thing that I would like to share with you today is related to the message of the three brains that we have, the three sections of the brains, and they are what? The new brain, so that's the outer brain, the middle brain, and the, the, low, the, the, the old brain. Yeah, so I, uh, I find this uh, talk quite interesting, so I'll, I'll try to play this. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed 
my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales are done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We, have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, 
And our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that you know, there's, uh, if you, if you, if you um, Hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, when you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the permu same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright, they had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright brothers' team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream worked with them with, for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts, because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight. And no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys. Now I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first. He didn't get rich. He didn't get famous. So he quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first 2.5% of our population are our innovators. The next 13.5% of our population are our early adopters. 
The next 34% are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchtone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> we all sit at various places at various times on the scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap, that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, cl uh, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, or stood in, six, in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out about eight or nine years ago to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well-funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk Time Warner DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even traded above six, except for a couple of little spikes. Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you. We don't need it. We don't like it. You're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, you know, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own, and they told people. And some of those people uh, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time, to hear him speak. How many of them showed up? 
for him. Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed. And it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there were two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the Civil Rights Movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. <laughs> Listen to politicians now with their comprehensive 12 point plans, they're not inspiring anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority, but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. So Simon Sinek talks about the three circles and how they correspond to the brain. So I just wanted to really anchor this thought. So the, we have the, the, the old brain and the middle brain where emotions are. And this is where and, and, uh, the basic instincts are. And this is where we can start. They don't have ability to process language. While you know, the outer brain, the newer brain, is where language is processed. And he suggests that we communicate starting with why. We say, why are we doing, why are we doing? Why are you using the iPad? So I just, before I, before I end, I was having um, a, a chat with uh, some of your colleagues here, and um, you were telling me that well, you were telling me that your brother is doing mechanical engineering year two, and he did not believe that she is going to build a robot and control it with the iPad by the end of the semester. Is he going to be disappointed? Yes. Right. So actually. We believe that we can do that. As a matter of fact, I believe that you guys, before you graduate, you actually can put a satellite in this space. Yeah. Yes, so how about, how about you still have almost five years, right? What about putting a satellite in the space from people who are within this room. Actually, it's definitely possible. It has been done, right? So we can do it. It's, there's nothing new there. The key thing is, do you want to do it or not? If you want to do it, we will, we will do it together. So I would like, with this, I'd like to thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Thank you.